Jeopardy! Issues and Attitudes airs each Monday at noon on 88.9 WEIU. Now, Issues and Attitudes. Is it possible to get? And a very good afternoon. Yes, it is, everyone. My name is Jeff Owens, Interim Director at WEIU. My co host, Alicia Haynes. Hi, everyone. We are talking today with Dr. David Graycon, Associate Professor of Common Studies. Hello. Thank yes, you. I'll get you a copy of the program. Okay. Is that what great. you're going to ask? <laughs> yes, I will. <laughs> and our other guest today is Dr. Francis Murphy. She's a professor in Health and Human Services here at uh, East Carolina University. So welcome, Dr. Murphy. Thank you. Appreciate you both coming in on this uh, Monday. If you're wondering what we're going to talk about, we're going to be talking about the Fulbright Scholar Teacher Slash Awards and, and uh Dr. Raycon, you uh, were last academic year, spent the entire year you know, doing this. So let, let's just talk about you know the ex where you were and what you did, and we'll get into some details. Sure. Um, so I had a year-long sabbatical where I was uh, I received a Fulbright uh, Scholar Award, um, and my project was a teaching project. So I taught uh, the subject of media literacy, which is uh, being able to critique the media, uh, but also learn how to make media. Uh, productions, videos, this sort of thing, uh, but really to be able to analyze media in a kind of like critical manner. And I was in Ivano Frankivs, <laughs> which is southwest Ukraine, and it's about, it's very close, it's within 50 miles of Poland, Hungary, Romania, and Moldova. And I was there for a year and I taught graduate students, and I taught undergraduate students at Precarpathian National University. And I also gave lectures all over the country, and I also trained other professors on how to do media literacy, because media literacy is a very hot topic there right now, especially with all the fake news and uh, Ukraine's being bombarded by Russia uh, very significantly. It's almost like a testing ground before they test <laughs> these things on the United States and other countries. Um, so in a sense, uh, it was the timing was perfect, so I ended up talking we talked about fake news and propaganda, and we talked about how uh, Russia is basically trying to destabilize Ukraine. And so the timing was really perfect. So I did a bunch of these different activities, and I also like wrote some things and made some short videos too. So now, how the Fulbright works? Did you choose to go to Ukraine, or is it, or is it just that's where you get placed? I, I, to explain to folks how Fulbright works. Sure. So you apply to a country, and uh, I. I chose Ukraine because I knew I had some family history there. Okay. And I also had some scholar friends who were just in Ukraine, and they're like, oh, it's a really interesting place to be because it's a new democracy. They're trying to, like, figure things out. They're trying, they're looking for new ideas about media and media production and media criticism. And they don't even have that field of study really in a lot of Ukrainian schools. So, you know, the universities, you know, yeah. they have... They'll have journalism, but they don't really have communication studies as like a broader field. Um, so I chose Ukraine as my top pick uh, because of family connections that I knew were there. If I didn't quite know where they were, <laughs> my family was like, you know, we have family in Ukraine. But then some of our the census records of my great grandparents said Poland, and some of them said Austria. So it was confusing. Uh, but at the end of the day. Uh, they're all correct because <laughs> so depending on when all the borders shifted because there's been so many border shifts there between different wars and uh, different periods of colonization that like the border shifted um, and I had also spent some time in Eastern Europe as an English teacher previously so I taught in Poland and Lithuania for one month stints through this organization called Bridges for Education, and I was teaching high school kids uh, English. Okay. And so I really liked Eastern Europe based on those experiences, and I was like, oh, I should try uh, Ukraine. And uh, I applied, and I got it. There you so go. I guess the question <laughs> everybody's asking out there is, did you get to find your family? Did you find family members over there or not? I didn't find actual f family members, yeah. um, but it was really unique in that I found out the, where the villages were of my great-grandparents. Okay. And they're actually in southeast Poland, what, it, what is now Southeast Poland, yeah. but at the time uh, was its own sort of uh, ethnic community in the Carpathian Mountains. They're called Lemko. <laughs> and I had no idea. I didn't know any of this before, but I joined this uh, Facebook page of, like, Ukrainian genealogy. And I just put my information up there, and this guy wrote me within a day and is like, I'm distantly related to you. <laughs> I've done all this research, and, like, your great-grandparents are from these two towns. That is awesome. And I went... And he recommended these, uh, this tour, this person who knows the area very well. She's actually a teacher, and she knew the Lemko language. <laughs> and I learned all this really interesting history about um, 
my great grandparents, the villages, and like why they immigrated. And um, but then after World War II, the Soviets came in and they basically ethnically cleansed this whole region. Mm -hmm. uh, so they basically pushed like Ukrainians back to Ukraine. They took and they sort of dot divided up these little villages like either to Ukraine or to Poland and they basically just cleared out the whole land or they even sent people to uh, like Siberia as political prisoners or um, so it's a, it was actually called Operation Vitsula and there's like some people trying to study that now so to answer the question about did I meet any of my family um, so that means those relatives who stayed in this village were scattered either to Ukraine or Poland but the Soviets destroyed a lot of those records. So it's really hard to find okay. relatives, you know, and I kind of reached a roadblock where it was like, I can't go any further. Um, and I asked some people to try to do some like archival research or they know these archives and it just kind of got stopped there. But it, it wasn't, I thought it was very interesting just to go to the villages and see them. I mean, the one village was destroyed. Uh, it was just a cemetery, and there was actually like a trench around it. And I was like, "What's that?" They're like, "That's from World War One." Holy! Like cow. that was a trench. <laughs> like soldiers were fighting in that. Like I was just like, "Wow!" So it was just like history is just so close, and like to think that my ancestors that remained were basically forced forcibly removed from their territories was like insane. <laughs> I mean, I could read about that in a book, but you know, to discover that firsthand, right? Um, and the sort of the atrocities of the Soviet Union. And how they were basically, you know, pushing people, and you know. So with the uh, with the scholarship that you got, and yeah. I know we're, we'll talk more about what the we'll Fulbright you. scholarship is. Yeah. Um, and I, I I have this question. So before I lose it, yeah, um, sure. Did they help you learn the language when you go with? So I know there's different things that you can do with the Fulbright. Yeah. Program, but you so you did teaching. Did you have to learn? Polish or um, Ukrainian. I mean, there's different dialects too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. How, what was that so, like? So, this part of Ukraine speaks primarily Ukrainian. Okay. Although everyone knows Russian. Okay. Or and or some Polish because Polish and Ukrainian is very similar. Right. Um, so, for this particular position, I didn't need to know Ukrainian because um, all my classes were in English. And for the students in Ukraine, that was extremely novel because they don't normally have native speakers teaching them classes, especially this is like a kind of more remote part of Ukraine mm -hmm. um, and they don't get a lot of foreign scholars at these universities um, but you know I felt it was my duty to learn some of the language because I feel it's a little um, a little insensitive to like go to another country for a year and not speak any of their language <laughs> so I took a two-week intensive course mm -hmm. in uh, the city of Lviv over the Christmas break and like before I left there's not really a lot of opportunities to study Ukrainian mm -hmm in where we are like the university of illinois has a course but i missed the timing of it and um so i had these like language cds where i was learning the language and it helped give me like a basic sense of the pronunciation mm -hmm. and like survival ukrainian um and then i learned a lot just from my students right. in the classes like i would be like translate like what does this mean how do i say <laughs> this and they would tell me and which was good which is important because that's how people really speak you right. know, like as opposed to like language classes, you know, they, they're giving me kind of like the slang and this sort of thing. Kind of cool. um, so I learned enough to get by and be functional. Mm -hmm. I can read. I can still, I can read the Cyrillic letters, which is like, uh, I think it's 28 letters. And so I can read all of those. God, that's interesting. And it took a while to figure that out because like P is R and then like, you know, like. You lost me a long way. Yeah, <laughs> like, like the letters are just like, you know, they're different. Um, that's it, that's but, fascinating to me. I just think it's language in general is fascinating. But when it comes to the program, yeah. Now you went for teaching. Yeah. That was the scholarship that you got. What what is the program and what yeah. different yeah. areas can you get a scholarship in? Yeah. That and just sense. a little bit more about the language. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some some Fulbright scholar grants require language fluency. Mm -hmm. So like if you're going to s some countries in South America and some don't. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it really depends on the one you're applying to because, okay. like, different countries have, like, different um, sort of rules or expectations. Um, so, what is the Fulbright? And we'll let Francis chime in here a little bit, too. So, Fr Fulbright is a uh, program sponsored by the U.S. government right. and the U.S. Department of State. And it's basically an exchange program. Uh, Senator Fulbright came up with this this idea. And I think the foundation of the Fulbright program is the idea that exchange and dialogue 
is vital for understanding other cultures. And you, you can do that the best by actually being immersed in another culture. So, you know, like learning the language and like eating the food and getting to know people firsthand is really the best way to mm-hmm. do that. Oh, absolutely. And, and Fulbright's not just a one-way flow from the U.S. to other parts of the world. Like scholars from all over the world, scholars, artists, teachers, journalists, writers, poets, you know, they all come to the United States too. So I actually just the other day met a professor at the University of Illinois who was from the next city over from me who's doing a Fulbright at the U of I. (laughs) (laughs) And so it was great. I mean, we didn't even meet each other in Ukraine, um, but we met... uh, I heard he was in town by some other people that I mm-hmm. know, and so we went and had coffee, and we were talking about Ukraine. Oh, that's and fascinating. He's talking about his challenges of living here in the Midwest and bringing his family here. So it's, like, really fascinating. Similar challenges, I'm sure. To hear. <laughs> so you want him the slang of this area, right? Right, right. Um, but the whole idea is exchange, cultural exchange, but also, um, you know, you want your project to be beneficial right. to the institution you're working for. So I was kind of filling a gap in terms of what they don't really have that class. Like, they don't have media literacy mm-hmm. at all. Um, and then, so I'm bringing that skill to them and teaching them. And, but of course, I'm learning a lot about Ukraine right. and Ukrainian media and like the problems they're dealing with and their history, which is so complex. Um, but then the idea is to come back to the United States and I share this information. So, you know, I talk about it in my classes. I, we're doing this right now. Yeah. This is part of what we're supposed to be doing, um, which is interacting with the media. And we hope to put together a talk on campus where uh, we can talk about this in a more open forum and have like a QA with students or professors or whoever want to come. Let's um, get Dr. Murphy involved real yeah, quick. Uh, yeah. when, you t- when you heard what Dr. Ray Cal was talking about there, you know, what kind of things are going your, through your mind and how are you involved with Fulbright here on campus? The Fulbright, you can actually participate on several different levels. Yeah. So um, Dr. Graycon and I were both had teaching awards and so you have to have a PhD a terminal degree to do that but then there are also research awards student research awards and then there's something called English teaching assistance so this is a Fulbright program that is available to young individuals with just a bachelor's degree so it's not just for professors it's also for young professionals young graduate students basically so and we interacted with with all with people who ha- who were in our countries for all of those reasons, and so that was enriching to me uh, the excitement of the of the younger students and then other people who were my colleagues, and that was that was very thrilling. When you were in the Ukraine, Dr. Rikon, yep. what what surprised you the most? Is there that one thing that you just had no idea that this was part of their culture over there? Wow, uh, that's a big question. Uh, things that surprised me about Ukraine. Um, well, if you're thinking about that, then I'll, I'll let you think for a second. Yep. Then when you talk about the media literacy, what what what's available? Do they, they have a lot of TV, a lot of radio, newspaper. Or yep. What do they mostly use to yep. to kind of disseminate information? Yeah, I mean, they use Facebook. Facebook is very common. Social, um, yeah. um, there's actually like a Russian version of Facebook that's actually banned in Ukraine and this is actually very controversial because a lot of people use it but then they use like you know VPNs that get around it like these ways to use the internet to make your computer pretend it's in another country so that you can uh, still use these services so it's kind of interesting because especially in West Ukraine there's a lot of anti-Russian sentiment and rightly so (laughs) and um, but there's weirdly this fascination or like interest in like Russian media still with among, especially young people yeah. and young people w- look at media from all over Europe and all over the world like um, students are interested in you know American media but also stuff from the UK or Germany or Japan you know so they have like this kind of very wide palette of media that they're interested in um, but yeah they have uh, there's a lot of print newspapers are still pretty big um, Ukraine's a very literate society, actually. They have a very high literacy rate. Um, you know, everyone had smartphones for the most part. Um, you know, I think one of the, going back to the things that are shocking, uh, some of the prices of things. So my, uh, my internet for my apartment costs $5 a month. $5 a month? <laughs> $5 a month. And my phone plan costs $3 a month. So, I mean, it was incredible to... You couldn't get that transferred back here. I mean, <laughs> I wish, you know, because those are very expensive uh, resources in the United States. And, like, in Ukraine, I was, like, stunned at, like, how inexpensive it was. But it's also, you know, in line with 
it's a very low standard of living there. It's, you know, Ukraine's, I think, the second poorest country in Europe behind Moldova, actually. <laughs> um, so, you know, it was very surprising, the, the sort of prices of things that compared to the United States was like pretty shocking. Take us into the classroom when you're when you're teaching media literacy to students. I mean, what kind of things? I always like to know what's on the the things of the people you're teaching. So, what what questions the students ask you the most, or what are they most curious about? Maybe not just what you're teaching, but what they also wanted to know about the United States. Yeah, I think because a lot of the students there get their impressions of the United States through the media, that yeah. they often had very distorted yeah. views of, you know, that all the streets are paved of gold <laughs> and you know um, there's a lot of stereotypes that emerge through the media that we actually challenged quite a bit of um, you know there's lots of things that I'm trying to think of some specific examples but you know I, I really didn't do what I was doing in Ukraine isn't that different than what I do here at Eastern in yeah. some of my classes like media criticism classes so we analyzed a TV commercial for example um, we did like a collage where they have to take some media and like remix it into like a collage and they were like we've never done anything like that they're just like that's totally new and we made some videos together which you know we left the classroom and went out into the community and made some short documentaries together and they're just like we've never done that like we don't leave the classroom like that we they were really impressed with the style of teaching because you have this old guard of professor in Ukraine, uh, quote unquote, the Soviet teachers, <laughs> and they're they're lingering, you know, they're lingering with this mindset from the former Soviet Union, which is like you come in as a professor and you're kind of like an authoritative, uh, I don't want to say a dictator, but, but like you in kind in of a way you're right. In, in, a, in a way, it is. So it's like there's no interaction. They come in, they read from a book, they close the book, they leave. That's it. And in my class, you know, we sit in a circle, we're having conversations, uh, they're able to express their opinions. They probably loved you then. <laughs> <laughs> they're able to express their opinions very freely, and like, you know, I was very open in what to, they had to say. I wasn't condescending towards them. And I'm not saying all Ukrainian professors are this way, because there's like a younger generation that's challenging sort of the old guard, like things are changing. But it takes a lot of years for that to sort of go away. Um, so I think the students really appreciated this style of um, collaboration, open discussion, critical thinking uh, was very much as part of media literacy. So you, so. What you said earlier is Ukraine's a democracy, but it seems like they're really still saturated with, you know, the dictatorship. So that, are the students conflicted in a way that it's okay yeah. to learn this way? Or yeah. do, they, do they, you think they liked it more than, than the kind of the old guard? Or oh, It's yeah. got to be weird growing definitely. up. Definitely. <laughs> I mean, they definitely were like, this is great. Like, we wish all our classes like were like this, you know. We watched, my classes were very multimedia. I brought in like my own projector and we watched videos and like analyzed songs and analyzed news articles. So it's very like hands-on and practical. And I think one of the biggest complaints I got from Ukrainian students was like, our studies aren't practical at all. Like it's all the theoretical and like the, some of the theory is like outdated. So I think they really appreciated that it was like very contemporary and what we're talking about were like very contemporary issues. And there are most certainly professors at the university I was at that are doing that too. But there's kind of an old guard that is still kind of lingering. And it is an emerging democracy, like they're still trying to figure out what that means. And um, I would say it's a very weak democracy right now because um, there's a lot of corruption in Ukraine. And it's a huge problem. It's probably the biggest problem of the country. Did so you feel comfortable there? I felt comfortable for the most part. I mean, we got briefed by the U.S. Embassy before we, we you know, we, a security briefing, actually. Yeah. And, you know, I was kind of concerned with, you know, because we are representatives of the United States and the United States government, and especially, you know, Russia doesn't like that. I mean, it's a kind of soft power, yeah. you know, so we're there representing the United States government, basically. And... Um, you know, we were briefed at this embassy meeting in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, and basically he's like, yeah, expect to be followed, expect to have surveillance, and um, just ignore it. Just go about your everyday life. And, you know, so I was a little concerned in my first semester because I wasn't sure how far I could take some of the concepts yet. And I was a little like, maybe if I say something that's too, <laughs> you know, things here that I would do here that are fairly commonplace, I, you know, if I were to do it there, would I get in trouble, or would this really make someone mad or angry? Uh, but under the Fulbright program, we have total freedom, intellectual freedom. So, and I always remembered that. But you never know. There could be people who, you know, is someone going to attack me with a crowbar outside the university after? I don't know. And like, I was a little, 
I definitely was a little scared. So and did you, you know, hold back a little bit before you? I held back, and then, then the second semester, I was like, okay, I'm going to go for it. I have one semester left. What do I have to lose? And I felt, you know, uh, I felt like there was enough safety to do it. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I, I think my computer was hacked relentlessly. I don't know who was hacking it, but my uh, pan Panther mail was hacked. My passwords always kept changing without my consent. Um, I went to the sent folder for several months. It would just be blinking. I couldn't actually like activate any of my files. Um, I saw I saw files on my desktop disappearing one day, so I had to just unhook everything and turn my internet off. Um, and then I brought it back to Eastern, and I brought it to the tech folks here, and they're like, what happened to this thing? <laughs> they had to clear everything off, totally debug it. They said it was attacked, like, mercilessly. Did so it was from the Russian government? It's hard to know who that was. You know, I'm assuming, you know, if we're looking at the current political state right now, like, the United S or, you know, Russia does not like Western interaction in Ukraine at all. You know, they want, they don't want Ukraine to go West, meaning the European Union and NATO pro-democracy, and um, there's forces that are against that, or they don't want it. I mean, Russia does not want Ukraine to be part of the European Union, or part of, definitely not part of NATO. Um, so it's hard to say exactly, like I can't, I mean, my theory is that it would be something connected to the Russian Federation, but it's hard to prove that. I mean, there could be um, other forces at work, but... Um, you know, I kind of just went with my gut, and I was like, you know, I'm just going to go for it. And um, I think after a while, you're not sure if, like, someone's following you or not. <laughs> and you're like, but I, I would like to think that that wasn't happening, but you never know. I mean, Interesting. Give, given, yeah, <laughs> the context. But what would you, when you hear that, what goes through your mind, Dr. Murphy? Moldova is even closer to Russia <laughs> and that's where than you were? you were. Right, I was yeah. in the Republic of Moldova, also a former Soviet state, and very small. As Dr. Gregon said, it's the poorest country in Europe, a distinction that is not altogether positive. So, um, I had a wonderful experience there, though. I my I did have a lot of technological issues with mm -hmm. my laptop and came home in the middle and it it had to be completely redone as well i didn't see evidence that somebody was hacking me but i'm not that computer savvy they could have been knocking on my door and i might not have known that technologically but uh, there is there is some um some resistance i think and and levels that we may not be aware of and I didn't have the kind of visibility in media and that sort of thing that, that you had. So mm -hmm. I felt physically safe. I didn't feel in any danger, um, you know, so far as crime or that sort of thing, which is, I think, an, a real improvement in Moldova. I was there 25 years previously, and I didn't feel quite so safe. Okay. We have about four or five minutes left to go. Let's say, we, you, and either you guys can talk on this. When you, when you talk about the country, we talked about some of the scary stuff and the teaching. But what about the culture and the arts and the food and stuff? Talk about you know the good stuff about those countries, if you could. In Moldova, you find people who are professional musicians everywhere, and theater is a, at least in the capital city of Chisinau, the th there are many many theaters. Live music is extremely accessible, and so that's really different from here. People value the arts, the performing arts, the, the fine arts, and also music. So I find that to be very uplifting. And it, the trouble is the country is so desperately poor that these individuals have a hard time making a living. But I tried to support live entertainment, live performances whenever I could. Okay. Yeah, so much uh, to say about that. Um, you know, one of the things I remember is the street music. I would go to uh, the city of Lviv, which is about two hours from where I lived in Novana Frank Keefs, and it would be the middle of winter, and there would be people out there belting out music in the middle of winter on the street. And I was just so impressed by that, like, energy. And, you know, it's almost like a symbol of Ukraine. Like, we're, it's a country that's been so riddled with oppression and countries taking it over and trying to form their own identity. So to have these, like, musicians on this cold winter day just like belting out these songs with an acoustic guitar like really made an impression on me um 
the food was, I thought, amazing. Um, I felt like, you know, we have like organic culture here in the United States, but like, I felt like everything was organic and farm to table mm -hmm. there because everything comes from the local fields and the mountains. Um, so this idea of like local food isn't like a novel thing <laughs> like it is here. It's, it's just how it is, yeah. you know, all the food, you know. So I really liked uh, the Vereniki, which is kind of like a pierogi. Um, I actually had like a top 10 list going the whole year. I was, I was like <laughs> trying to find the best Vereniki in the country and I was <laughs> the best ingredient and my students loved it because I, like, I was like obsessed with these Vereniki and they're like what's the best Vereniki and then they would all be like my grandma makes the best Vereniki you know you have to and I was like I want your grandma's Vereniki like invite me over um, but uh, awesome. but you know some of the one of the things I was really impressed with is you know there's a huge brain drain in in Ukraine so like mm -hmm. a lot of the smart smartest you know there's a huge IT community actually in Ukraine and a lot of students like they're conflicted should I leave Ukraine so this is brain drain. I could go to, they could go to Poland, be say a custodian and make more than a professor in Ukraine oh, wow. because the wages are so different and the currencies mm -hmm. are so different. So there's this kind of two camps. They're just like, I want to get out of Ukraine and then go, I want to go to Poland. I want to go to Germany or I want to go to Spain or the UK and start a career there where I can make more money. And then there was a lot of people also who are like, I want to stay in Ukraine and fight. Like I want to make the society. Like, I want to stay here and, you know, make us a strong society and help change it. And I was just, like, so blown away by that, that enthusiasm and energy to want to make their society something better, better, despite all this corruption and the poverty and, like, the inability to change anything there. So it's, I was really impressed by these really young students who are just like, yeah, I want to stay here and fight. And I want to make this the country I want it to be. It was so uh, inspiring. Were you, when do you, do you want to go back or, or have you thought about that yet? Or, I or actually, out of time go ahead. Yeah, just. yeah, I actually might go back this summer. Uh, I was thinking about, cause I didn't have time to make a film cause I was mainly teaching. And I was thinking about going back to make a film about um, sort of underground music cultures. Uh, there's a lot of electronic music there and punk and heavy hey, metal. That's cool, yeah. And so I was like, it'd be really neat. And I became friends with some of these people. I actually put on an event with a couple bands. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. And uh, I was thinking about going back and making a documentary potentially this summer. There so you go. We'll see. That's cool. Will you go back to Moldova? I hope so. Very. The soonest I can go is when I want to go. <laughs> That's a great answer. Well, we, man, this, I told you, 28 minutes goes fast. We're, we're about out of time. So real quickly, if someone wants to find out more about the Fulbright that's on campus or any information, what's the fa best way to do that? Well, I think you could email either of us. But also, if, if you do a Google search of Fulbright, uh, you can get the .org site that gives all kinds of information. I encourage people to really explore this option. There you go. Yeah. There's a nice video on there. It kind of explains a little bit what it is and things like that. So, Dr. Murphy, Dr. Gray Count, again, thanks for coming in. And uh, it's a really neat show. Wish we had more, I had more time to ask you some more questions, but we're out. So, have a great day, everybody. This is Simmix. Thank you very much. Thanks.